Thank you, everyone, for joining us today. My name is Alexandra Deschamps-Oncino, and I'm the Chief Design Officer at the Design Council. Um, the Design Council is the National Strategic Advisor to the UK Government on Design. And why are we here? Why am I chairing this particular discussion? Um, it's because of the work that's downstairs. So if you've been working your way through the Sackler Centre, you'll see um, the uh, Designing London's recovery program that we've just run, uh, both in partnership with the Greater London Authority and also UCL's Complex Urban Systems for Sustainability and Health. I think the acronym is easier to say, but I think it's just good practice. Um, and uh, really that's a program helping and supporting 11 different groups and teams to produce different pieces of work from policy making to product design to different pieces of communication. And they're all, well, I don't think all of them, I think eight out of the 11 are exhibited downstairs. So please do have a look at that uh, when you come out of this particular discussion. Um, what are we gonna talk about? We're really gonna talk about uh, an extension of this, which is the role of design in complex urban challenges. And who do we have? to talk about this. Um, a fantastic group of panelists. We're gonna start with Jansu. Jansu Denise Bayrak is the head of fundraising at Bethnal Green Ventures. She started her career in international politics and human rights law before moving to work in early stage startups, which is where we met, I think, in 2012. Um, at uh, Bethnal Green Ventures, she leads on fundraising, runs C2 Series A deals, and manages commercial relationships and partnerships. Gabriela Gomez Mont, am I getting that right? Uh, is visiting professor of practice and senior policy fellow at the UCL Institute for Innovation and Public Purpose. She's the founder and director of Experimentalista, a novel type of nomadic and creative office specializing in city. She was also the former chief creative officer of the uh, of Mexico City and the founder of Laboratorio para la Ciudad. La Ciudad. The award-winning experimental arm and creative think tank of the Mexico City government, reporting directly to the mayor. And finally, Robin Scott, co-founder and CEO of Apolitical. Um, it's a global network and a learning platform for government. Prior to Apolitical, she founded several companies and social enterprises, wrote an acclaimed memoir about growing up in Botswana, worked for the Financial Times, and is also a World Economic Forum young global leader, and Gates Cambridge scholar. Please welcome our panel. So we're gonna, we're gonna talk about this for about 40 minutes. We'll have some questions and then please prepare yours. I think this is an extraordinary panel, an extraordinary conversation to happen post-COVID, in a recovery phase at this particular time, in this particular atmosphere politically as well. I wanna start with a very general question, which is how do you address in your work or how have you addressed in your work these so-called wicked problems? I'm gonna start with you, Jensu. Sure, thanks, Alex. I hope everyone can hear me fine. Thanks so much for being here today. Uh, so perhaps I should start by telling you a little bit about BGV and what we do. So we are Europe's uh, leading early stage tech for good VC. What that means is that we invest in tech, tech and tech-enabled products and services that are built and designed to be inclusive and affordable while positively affecting millions of lives. Uh, we've been doing that since 2012. We have a portfolio of 165 plus companies, 80, 90 of them are still alive and operating. And we invest across what we like to call three very wide uh, impact buckets, which are a sustainable planet, healthy lives and a better society. Um, so I guess, um, first of all, I'm a venture capitalist, and one thing that I hear in my own little bubble of, you know, the VC world is venture capital being a catalyst for so many of our global problems. 
I slightly disagree with that in the sense that this is just one of the many vehicles or tools that we, we might be able to use to help come with solutions that are hopefully not only affordable, but also built by the people who are most affected by those. And in that sense, what we try to do at BGV is we try and enable people from all walks of life to help um, build their companies. So we try and invest in underrepresented um, founders, particularly across the UK, while although we do have some founders that we've invested in across Europe as well. Um, so from our perspective, we do believe that all of, all of the global problems are really, really interlinked. So we can't really talk about investing for the climate without talking about financial inclusion, for example. Or we can't really talk about food security without talking about citizen engagement. So our theory of change is that the more people uh, that are directly affected by the problems are coming up with solutions, the more inclusive the whole innovation economy will become. Very powerful, thank you. Gabriella. In terms of um, wicked problems, Mexico City is as wicked as it comes. Uh, <laughs> so as one of the megalopolises of the world, I think I had the fortune as well as um, something that kept me up at night since I was in government and even after that, in terms of exactly that. How do you enter a city? How do you start disentangling the symbiotic nature of urban agendas? And so first of all, one of the very first things that we did coming into the lab, and this is also the way that I'm working with other cities across the world, such as Bogota, is truly t taking a transdisciplinary perspective. How do you have a prismatic view on the city's issues? So for example, building transdisciplinary teams I find incredibly important, because I think one of the big issues of how we've tried to deal with the wicked problems, and any problem really at an urban scale nowadays, is a very technocratic view on cities, uh, thinking that there is a way to solve cities from one day to another, and that's actually not true. I think most of the biggest questions that humanity is facing and that hence that cities are facing are actually quite messy in many ways. So first of all, having half of my team from urban political sciences and the other half from the humanities, so everybody from political scientists, internationalists, urban geographers, AI experts, uh, civic tech experts, working hand in hand with artists, designers, filmmakers, writers, historians, philosophers, futurists, artists, etc., was incredibly important because that way, instead of addressing the city through one single entry point, we could first of all start asking the big questions of how do we imagine the city? How do we want to live together? How do we want to move together? How do we want to be healthy together? And from there, doing a sweep of what already exists, because I think one of the biggest things that we don't take into account many times is that the most underutilized resource that a city has is actually citizen talent. So how do you start figuring out what resources exist in a city everywhere? How do you start articulating it? And then also identifying the gaps that exist and what can be done about them. So everything from good practices to experiments that need to be done, and then gathering communities around questions. I think good questions actually engender universes, as they say. So and how do you start creating agendas that can take on a life of their own. So a vision for a megalopolis, in case of the lab, it was an open city, a playful city, a creative city, a participatory city, a global city, and then a, a portfolio of best practices, foundational work, and experiments that can go everything from creating the first APIs for Mexico City to crowdsourcing the Constitution, which was paradigmatic not only for us, but for the world. So it's a messy space. I think we need to design uh, taking that in mind that cities do not sit still. So how do we also start thinking about dynamic practices and dynamic design in every which way? So that's kind of like a small taste, because I have a lot to say about that. Um, but that was more or less some of the components when we were thinking about the wicked problems of Mexico City. Thank you, amazing. Robin. Thank you, and I think um, most governments are a nexus of, of wicked challenges, and, and just to underscore this point, and, I, and I'm a sucker for wanting to work on wicked challenges, before starting Apolitical, I was working in maximum security prisons in South Africa, um, teaching coding and working with you know, people who are in, in very difficult conditions, and still the work with government is much, much harder than that. Apolitical is... Um, just to recap, it's a global community and learning platform for government online. We are used by around 200,000 public servants and policymakers in 160 different countries at all levels of government. And we, we 
believe very passionately that we need to see more collaboration across the government stack, right from multilaterals down to the most local level. The way we work is, um, first of all, we're galvanized by this extraordinary number, which is that if governments just did what was already working, this is status quo best practice in other cities, other departments, other countries, it would save $3.5 trillion a year. Now, that will surprise no one who's worked with government, but it gives a sense of the, the benefits of unlocking the hive mind of government, which is what we are obsessed with. So how do we create learning that taps into the social knowledge of government? So we're a knowledge sharing platform and we also have courses that um, public servants take online socially with their peers. So you might be learning, for example, we have a great course with um, a team at Oxford University on sustainable finance, but you will be learning alongside your peers in government and learning from them. So we think a lot about teasing out the how. There's a lot of what in government, the what's the easy bit, the how is the really tricky bit. And that's where um, peer insights are so important. And then on the wicked problems themselves, just to echo what's already been said, um, win-wins, what's sometimes called multi-solving now, nothing is going to be done unless we do that. And in our years of work with government, we've, we've developed a, a theory, a framework for what makes for successful 21st century governments. And there are four pillars of this. The first pillar is, it's a little bit of a catch-all, but it's what we call 21st century statecraft. And that's the toolkit for public sector officials um, in a 21st century world. So citizen engagement, agile governance, human-centered design. You can't, you can't operate well in government unless you're doing these. The second is digital and data technology. Everything's got that. It's, it's the, the blood running through um, everything today. So you have to factor that in. The third is um, climate and sustainability. And the fourth is equity, equality, and inclusion. And we think every successful policy or program in government needs to be shot through with those four considerations. There's a lot going on in everything that you've shared. And I, I sort of want to pick on a, a red thread, which I think is leadership and defining leadership. Um, what for you is defined sort of the best kinds of leaderships in complex situations and whether you have examples for our audience, examples for our audience online as well later, Jansu. That's a tricky one, I think. Um, one of the things that we've seen is, that what, so you said leadership and what I'm hearing is actually the ability to create and sustain change. So that's the angle that I'm going to take this. And what's um, particularly in our portfolio, but also throughout the work we do, what we've seen is the more empathic we are towards the other party's definition of success, the more successful our collaborations become. So, and I mean, the main thread in everything I've done in my career is definitely whatever we like to call it is business development and stakeholder management. And I don't think a lot of people understand the value of actually really understanding what what means to be successful for the third party. So I think the, the people who are, who who are leaders are not just people who are deep thinkers, but who who really have um have the space to really listen to the other and then help come up with common ground and also common strategy so both parties can not only benefit from the halo effect in air quotes but also you know more often than not we all have a f some sort of founder or an investor that we need to show some KPIs to, to ensure that there's sustainability of the interventions that we're doing in whichever, you know, I'm talking as an venture capital investor here, but I see that in a lot of different asset classes as well. So how can we make sure that we are giving those people the ammunitions that they need to take to their own investors and funders so that we can help grow the, you know, capital flow to, the, to where it's most needed? Gabriella. I think uh, some of the things that we considered um, when I was working in Mexico City was 
A, how do we start figuring out um, how to open up spaces for other people to come in and participate? One of them was just understanding how much talent and smarts is um, within the activist world and how can you make space. So instead of having a contentious relationship, you can sit at the table and deal through the tensions that this entails. Another thing that was incredibly important is um, my team's average age was 28 years old, more or less, which is more or less the average age of Mexico City. And to my huge surprise and delight, every time that there was an opening at the lab, we would have more or less about 300 people applying for some of these roles. So I have the feeling that sitting with youth and prototyping what government means to them, especially in this moment of democratic crises, if you will, of understanding how do we make politics relevant once again for a generation that might be completely mistrustful of government and public and political institutions, but they, I, I mean, I am awed by the amount of energy and time that they're willing to add to these urban conversations. So I do think that there is a really uh, critical discussion to be had of how do we engage youth within these conversations and not by giving them voice in terms of inviting them to the table, but actually handing over leaderships, in fact. And last but not least, with all of these, this talk about horizontality, which I find incredibly important and interesting of how do we become every time more inclusive and open. I think that true, like complete perfect horizontality doesn't exist and we still need leaderships, but we need leaderships that instead of being entrenched in the way that we see power can actually distribute it and know that power and holding leadership has to be just as dynamic. So notwithstanding that you bring in a fantastic person, like what is the place of the next brilliant person within this? So really understanding in a much deeper fashion, let's say what urban governance could be like, dynamic shape-shifting hybrid, I think is a really interesting conversation going forward in terms of cities. And then also, you know, mayors, for example, not as city managers, Again, I, I think that the technocratic turn did a lot of harm to cities and part of the democratic crisis is due to that, but rather people that can are able to hold a political imagination as well, a political collective imagination that, as you say, really knows how to do a lot of deep listening um, and is an acrobat in many ways because I think you know the volatility of the times at hand and everything coming towards us means that we need to have very strong compasses, but the, the way we get there is going to shape shift every time. So what does that mean like in terms of agile government, but agile everything, ag agile citizenship, agile belonging, agile structures in general? Robin. It's such a challenging question because so much needs to go right for successful leadership. There's so much to say. I'm going to mention three things. Um, the first uh, attribute, um, uh, and again, I'm applying the government lens, comes out of some research we did uh, looking at what's different between successful leaders um, and innovators in the private sector versus government. And as you'd imagine, a lot of the threads are common, but there was something distinct in government, which is the ability to be patient for a very long time. Because when you're trying to move a system and you've got a lot of stakeholders. Sometimes you just have to sit there and build alliances and build trust and then wait for the political winds to come in behind you. So that's one, and we really see that in the, the public servants you deal with, just this very long view of what it's going to take to change. The second is really to highlight something that is, for the most part, just so blazingly absent, um, so damagingly absent, which is articulations of exciting, mobilizing visions. They don't have to be utopian, but if you just take climate, um, the amount of time given to the cost and the compromises in the narrative versus the positive outcomes is super depressing. And there's more and more evidence. There was a paper from Oxford a couple of weeks ago showing that, in fact, the transition to um, a clean economy is probably going to save trillions of dollars by um, 2050 because of the uh, just incredible um, plunge in costs of renewable energy. So it might actually save us money, but the narrative is still stuck like 30 years ago and going to cost us so much. So, so narratives and visions, compelling mobilizing visions, I think that's a big gap. And then um, finally on the political side, um, just again reflecting on our experience, so we have this online platform mainly focused on training the civil service. But we also have, and that's a B Corporation, we also have a non-profit foundation which focuses on, we have what we call a network of political leadership incubators around the world. Um, all of them work with grassroots, they're all led by grassroots political entrepreneurs. Um, and the idea is to fill the political pipeline with 
different sort, a different sort of leader. And one of the central attributes to that is people who are willing to speak across the aisle, mm -hmm. to entertain others who think differently. And that is just so absent in so much of the leadership we see today. It's some wide varieties of thoughts for us. We are at the London Design Festival. We um, are here because of a project around London's recovery. What do you think in all of your careers, what do you think is the role of design? And how have you seen that role change throughout your careers? Jansu. Sure. I guess I look at it from a relatively limited perspective. I'm not a designer. I don't work with designers. I work with entrepreneurs. But one of the main things that we work with them on, and the model of BGV is they, they receive some very modest amount of funding, and then they go through a structured program. So it's very similar to an acceleration program, really. And we run, I think, 17 or 18 of those over the years. And one uh, module that we've ended up expanding and expanding and putting a lot of emphasis on is essentially uh, designing your product with users in mind. And this is not strictly about just you know the product itself, but we are also, as an investor, quite selfishly, we're trying to ensure that they're building something that they can sell. And you would be amazed how many times that people just sit down and start building in their own bubble without actually really talking to people who would A, be directly using their product or service, and be paying for that. So I guess uh, in my line of work, that's something that we really, really take, but we, we put a lot of emphasis on. And whenever I talk to early stage investors, like they talk about product market fit, and that's actually the product market fit comes down to design thinking from my perspective. So um, I think it's really, really important, particularly because I work for, currently for a micro fund, and which means that we have limited resources. So there's definitely an element of what we do and how we ensure that what we do really works for the sort of entrepreneurs we work with. So in that sense, we also have a framework around our own investment thesis or our own, for example, how we recruit entrepreneurs, etc., etc. that goes into uh, that a lot of thinking goes into. And I do I do see that we also take a lot of uh, learnings from you know design thinking principles in that sense. Gabriella. So uh, as I mentioned, the team at the lab and the teams that I work with now are incredibly transdisciplinary in nature. And we always start uh, with this transdisciplinary perspective coming up with a question that will articulate our work. So let's say right now that I've been advising the mayor of Bogota, Claudia Lopez, and her team on economies of care, the question that we're holding is how do we restructure a whole city around care? So first of all, there is this delicious thing of the way that designers can unfold a, a problem and how do we go from a, a big philosophical conceptual question in this sense, and how do we start creating a scaffolding that will get us to other social and urban realities. And that will include everything from designing a map forward to what are the communities that we need to map out, how do we articulate them, how do we orchestrate and shift this role of government from a some uh, uh, thing that provides services and deals with complaints to rather like this grand orchestrator of citizen talent and of ecosystems and whatnot. No? Um, that said, I also think that in a way, one of the, thing, the, the things that I really appreciate the work in, of the Design Council because it counterbalances the fact that many times I feel that design is falling into a trap of wanting to oversimplify issues. So, you know, those five steps of take out the post-it notes, put up your charts, and in a two-hour workshop, you've solved the city, or you've solved the project, or you've <laughs> solved this. I think that that has done it a lot of harm because it minimizes the role that design can have in these incredibly complex, wicked issues and problems. And then it also detools us, if you will, of what is actually possible when we can create a holding space for complexity and for all the work that needs to be done and all the voices that need to be heard and all of the disciplines that need to be present. Um, so for us, design came in, again, both in kind of like the grand pictures, but also giving a voice to the lab. Like the reason why we had 4,000 people helping us map out um, for the first time, the biggest informal bus system in the world, which is the one of Mexico City, that we had no idea what was happening on the ground, 
was because we were able to craft a good story that people wanted to be part of. So I would go as far as saying that democracy in the end might be a bigger story that people want to be part of. So it is that important to deal with these issues that so many times policy and cities and governments and companies don't take into account. And I think design has an incredibly important role there. Again, if we can go back into the nuance to think of transitional design and systemic design and many of the things that I know that the Design Council has been pushing forward. And just, I mean, yes, it's, it, it makes us all feel good and it's a lot of hand-holding for everybody, but I think that truly figuring these out, we need to also hold space for that feeling of risk and messiness um, and complexity and nuance. Amazing, thank you so much. Um, Robin, does design feature in your life and when you talk to governments? Yeah, I don't think you can live without design um, featuring in, in, in so many ways. I, I'll just... Um, I'm not an expert, but looking at it from a policy perspective, I think you can think of design from an outcomes lens, and it's the process by which you achieve the best outcomes for the relevant stakeholders working within constraints. And I hope, by the way, just to pick up on the democracy thread, that we can spend a little bit of time on that too. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, I think this uh, this is also sort of moving me towards um, conversations about transdisciplinarity, multiple stakeholders. What we're also talking about is the ability for governments to work with the private sector, with the third sector, for things to sort of be continuously about engagement across the stack, if you will. Mm -hmm. um, have you, do you have examples to give us of you know good ways of doing things, maybe bad ways of doing things, but just things for us to again learn from your amazing experience, Jansu? Uh, sure. Um, so one concrete example that I can give, and um, I just noticed their sign downstairs. I'm like, ooh, that will feature my panel. <laughs> uh, is the Civic Innovation Challenge. So um, uh, BGV designed and delivered the first iteration of that. And when we came to it, the idea was that essentially, how can we, to your point, you know, how can we uh, use the untapped citizen talent in the city while also creating uh, income streams for them through the big, the biggest stakeholders from the private sector that we work with uh, at the GLA. Uh, and I'm sorry if there's some people from GLA here and it has massively changed and I'm talking about something else right now, but it used to be that. Uh, anyway, so one thing that we've seen there is essentially without funding, we could only take the company so far. And one, but one thing that really, really worked well was that if those, if the private sector companies can see something that's directly beneficial to somehow their operations, and that's a no-brainer, and if you're able to get them in the same room, then those those projects really took off. But the others where they sort of failed to generate some, some buying from the private sector partners, then they have really struggled. I think, you know, I would argue that that's a learning that we could have done without actually doing the whole project, but you know, we did try to move some capital there, and I know that now there are different iterations of the program. And then I want to talk about one of our portfolio companies who I think does this really well. They're a company called Commonplace. Uh, they're a citizen engagement platform, and uh, one of the founders, Mike, he's absolutely brilliant, and I think they joined the program before my time. I've been with BGB for four years now. Um, and I think their initial idea was that how can we make sure Sure, the residents' voice is being heard. So that was their uh, initial problems, problem statement. Um, and they ended up, you know, they did different things, but what they landed on and what, what seems to be working really well is a platform that they actually sell to developers uh, so that they can use it with local authorities who don't really have the budget to make that company sustainable. Uh, but the outcome is the same, but they found who would be paying for that. So I think I can talk about smaller success stories more than I see like programmatic success stories, but that does um, that does come down to, to my initial point around, you know, what, what it means to be successful as a partner in a project. Another thing that we've done, both 
successfully and unsuccessfully was to try and um, get more charities and endowments to become impact investors. And the way the ones that really worked well is when we explained to them that they can't just talk about their charitable objectives, they need to think about supporting the wider ecosystem, whereas the ones that failed was when they were trying to see very, very direct results in their business. Uh, and it's just very hard to do when particularly you're working on social change and social problems, whereas I would argue it could be a tiny bit more easier when you're talking about environmental change. Thank you. Gabriella. So as, as you mentioned, I just joined uh, IIPP, um, the Institute for Innovation and Public Purpose at UCL, uh, with uh, Mariana Masucato, who's uh, the wave of new economists that, if you don't know her, she's an absolute force of nature. I'm biased, but I think she is. And uh, I'm sure one of the things. Everyone knows her, my God. <laughs> <laughs> and one of the things that I love about her take is, first of all, saying, okay, innovation is political. Like, we, again, we cannot get away from talking about the societies that we imagine, and we need to bring in discussions on our economy and on the mission of companies individually as well as collectively into how do we drive public purpose, again, at the forefront. So I think that this is the only way forward. I don't think we cannot go forward without thinking deeply about private, public-private partnerships. At the same time, I think we also need to acknowledge that we have an issue with sequestered imagination. Let's say in terms of an urban agenda, the way that smart cities has taken over as almost the only way that you can understand innovation at a city level, I find incredibly problematic in many ways um, that I can get into later. So how do we start really thinking that what governments need to do is hold that imagination, like we need to bring back the imagination to one that is socially and purpose driven, and then everything gets articulated around that. So I think we've seen fabulous cases and horrible cases of how that political system can work in doing so. I mean, in the US, super PACs have basically sequestered a political system. In the Netherlands, where I lived until recently, I find it incredibly interesting how so many incentives have put in to start pushing for circular economy. So you have everything from um, ar architectural firms to universities to studios that, yes, they're out to make a profit, but how do we make a profit? What type of world do we want to inhabit together? Like, how do we actually think of crises and as well as uh, what things cost, not now, but towards the future? Because, I mean, I just want to see the cost of all of the things we're going to be facing towards the future. So I do think that, again, like, we cannot just hand over the idea of the futures that we should be expecting to corporations, which has been the way that many times when corporations are sitting at the table, they have such a stronghold on the direction of so many things, but rather open up a much more nuanced, in-depth conversation, of, again, of going back to first principles. What type of cities and societies do we want? How do we get there? And then what is the role of all of the actors that need to be at the table to do so? Wonderful. Robin. So, so just a couple of per perhaps disparate thoughts on this. Um, the first is I think government is definitely under leveraged as a convener. Even the smallest, um, least resourced local councils still have enormous soft power and convening ability. And where that's deployed well, um, it, can, it can form the, the seed of really powerful uh, multi-sector collaboration. So we should see more of that. Then I just want to zoom in on something really um, seemingly technical and pedantic that's fascinating. And this is terminology and the issues if you don't get terminology right. So I was told a story the other day about um, a foundation that is look at, first facilitates lots of public-private collaborations and is particularly interested right now in the whole digital public goods space and has a team that um, comes in and works on definitions when it convenes groups of people to discuss this. And they were, I was speaking to someone who was initially very skeptical of like spending a whole lot of time on you know, a glossary, um, when you've got so many grand things to talk about. But apparently, um, in, this, in this definitional space, it turned out there was a huge sort of misunderstanding, different understanding around the difference between digital public goods and digital public infrastructure, and getting, which could seemingly be exchangeable in the face of it, and getting clarity around that just led to unlocking all kinds of um, richer conversations and more empathetic conversations. The final thing I'd say is um, 
just echoing a little bit the, the model for, for commonplace when governments don't necessarily have funding. One of the things we um, are very excited about is the willingness. So, so we provide learning to government and governments have learning budgets and often they buy it. But especially in poorer countries and sometimes even in wealthy countries, that can be difficult. So we work with foundations and companies who work with government, who both of whom can benefit if government is more skillful. And I find that very exciting because so much of what's going wrong is, you know, the, the, the dismissal of government. And this gets back to the, the democracy question, but uh, government doesn't work, so we have to work around it. It's much better to say, okay, how can we help the people in government be more effective? And just to jo join a final dot, one of the, for example, we work with the Gates Foundation on, on gender equality. And one of the, the needs and opportunities that's come out of that is just the care economy, how, how much cities and countries need to learn about that. Uh, Alex, if I may jump in. Absolutely. I guess uh, one thing that, you know, that really links what your, the two points that you made is essentially, you know, you mentioned soft power and the power of com co like convening that the government can provide, but there's also regulation that helps push private sector in, in the right, well, right in air quotes direction. I've been thinking a lot around ESG and impact in asset classes, and I've, I've immersed myself in a very unpleasant word of a lot of acronyms that all sound very similar, but some of you might have heard of SFDR, for example. I think it stands for Sustainable Finance Disclosure something. <laughs> Non-financial non disclosure. Alex knows this better, and uh, and the way you talked about you know defining some some people jokingly refer to SFDR eight as a green dictionary, but what we can't define we can't measure, and what we can't measure we can't improve. So it's absolutely crucial that you know we we take we try and have these dis definitions, and we because that's the only way to have meaningful discourse. With that in mind, because I think we could talk for hours about these issues, which are extremely gnarly, and I don't want to drop what you've, you know, sort of highlighted, which is this idea of democracy. Is there such a thing as designing democratic structures, infrastructures, services? And again, where is the role of design in that conversation? Where is the role of the designer in that conversation, whether they be a classically trained designer? whether they be someone who's walked into service design, policy design as time goes by. Can we design democratic infrastructures? I'll start with you, Robin. So, so first of all, I have been obsessed for the last few weeks with this research that came out from a think tank called Onward, which some of you might know, which is looking at young people and their views on democracy. And this represents a trend globally, but it was on Britain. And um, broadly, um, and I, I, I'm not sure on the exact figures, but from what I recall, 60% of young people are now believe that governments might be better off without constraints like elections and parliaments because they haven't been delivering that system. So that's skepticism of democracy. F nearly 50% of young people, and it was 18 to 34-year-olds, nearly 50% think that military rule is a good idea. Mm. And I mean, that's staggering. We tend to think of the, the next generation as the one that's going to you know, lean into to democracy and, and save us from ourselves, but no. And so, so working backwards from those terrifying figures and to, starting at the downstream end, one thing is just to deliver and, and cities are the... Um, are the kind of epicenter of where citizens meet government. So they have the most power. And part of it is just showing up and seeing your government working for you. So design work that leads to services that people benefit from and therefore trust in is just absolutely critical. And then obviously, if you go back upstream, all the work around citizen um, uh, citizen engagement. I'm particularly interested in participatory budgeting because that's been shown to increased trust in government, particularly in low-income communities. If you get a say in the budget, you're then more likely to participate in other aspects of civic life. And, and just to pick up on that, are we also, in that same thought, talking about visibility of services? Because I do think an awful lot of people 
have absolutely no idea where their taxes go. It's just sort of baked into the infrastructure and the materiality of day-to-day -day life. And so that, that transparency element. Totally, and there's a meta point to be made here, which is one of the ironies of citizen engagement is it's like the best tool of democracy that most people have never heard of. And one of the challenges arising from it is actually unequal access. So you have this great tool, but you don't have the visibility of the tool to make sure the right people are participating. I mean, I, I'm, you probably have so much more to say on this because Mexico's amazing experiments on that, on that front. But yeah, visibility, key. Gabrielle. Um, so I think design has um, a hand in so many of the different levels of, of what democracy is and could be, as well as perhaps uh, unwittingly the consequences, um, you know, externalities that actually go against what we consider democratic infrastructure. Um, I saw that, that study and I was also just, my eyes went wide. And it was more or less the context that we were working in as well in Mexico City, because while we were in government, uh, there was a Pew survey that actually had Mexico at the very top of the list of people who didn't think that democracy served any purpose to better their lives. So it was only 14% that believed in democracy. 14. 14. So, um, so it, it, it is daunting. At the same time, what makes me quite hopeful is that if we start shifting the language, for example, and start talking to, to citizens, first of all, language, yes, absolutely. So why have we started talking about citizens as users, for example, is beyond me. Because, I mean, language is the first Trojan horse. As political scientists like George Lakoff had really tried to drive in, like the words that we use, the metaphors that we use, actually engender realities. They frame discussions, they make things possible and other things impossible. So returning to the language of democracy, I think is one of the most important things that we could do right now. And then also figuring out that, yes, many times participation, democratic participation is a right and it's an obligation, but how do we go back to making it fascinating again? Like, you know, how does democracy become something that you engage with willingly? And if I was an academic, maybe I'd feel slightly naive of saying this, um, but I was in government and I saw how we had, let's say, 1,400 people signing up for a data festival, for God's sakes, which is super geeky, and we had them for 48 hours with us without sleeping. We saw, as I mentioned, 4,000 people helping us um, map the, the informal bus system of Mexico City, when some of these lines we found out later to and fro took them nine hours and a half, which is wild. We had more than half a million people helping us crowdsource the Mexico City Constitution. If and when you open up the right discussions and you think about our collective life and the life of cities as something that touches, policy touches everything that we hold the dearest, including even our sex lives, for God's sakes. So, you know, how do we make that relevant again and how do we find these entry points where we can once again understand the relevance of this? I, I was also another study that I was wide-eyed with, UK-based, uh, Lorena Hertz, another economist, has a book out called The Lonely Century. And she's putting a cost to what loneliness is costing the UK. And many of the reasons why we have started without meaning to, to disentangle our sense of uh, belonging to each other and to the places that we inhabit is actually because of the type of digital commercial first infrastructure that we've been creating, which makes our life seamless and super practical and super efficient. But then what does it mean that you don't even have to leave your house? I mean, during the pandemic, it was incredibly useful, but that is actually making us go back in. So. The urban agenda and the digital agenda are one of some of the most transformative powers out there. And don't get me wrong, because I do need have a caveat. Like I actually think a digital agenda done correctly is in crucial for cities and societies and governments and everything. But again, like I, I make an emphasis again, like how does our collective life take precedence over commercial gain in terms of our language, our structures, et cetera, et cetera. So much to do. Jansu, you get our closing words before we move on to q and I do want some questions, so please think about them. Uh, I'll try and pull on the digital and tech thread here. And I guess the one thing that I want to say is, you know, to your point earlier, I quite like the saying, you know, the personal is political. And the, in, that, in the same context, tech is not neutral. And tech can only be judged in, within the context and by whom it was created. And therefore, while I see so much potential for making infrastructure more efficient and more accessible, we should be super careful about, you know, 
uh, just just using AI, for example, as a silver bullet when we're trying to come up with more egalitarian solutions within the context of cities. And I'm not only talking about smart cities. I'm an immigrant and I'd be terrified of an AI-backed immigration system, for example. Like the computer says no is such a massive problem because those algorithms are even though we're trying to make it better collectively, are still written by people who come from a very, very small bubble across the world. Uh, I'm referring to Silicon Valley mostly here. But, you know, uh, I do believe that design can have make democracy more engaging for others. But one thing that I was thinking uh, from the um, statistics that you both shared, like I'm a millennial and I'm Turkish, so I, I know that, you know, living under military rule is no joke and uh, I you really shouldn't be wanting that. But also because we live in such a fluid and um, uncertain world, I can totally understand the youth's need for some sort of framework. And again, I don't want to go on a massive tangent here, but it makes me think about, you know, the state as a father, you know, this, what does the state provide? Is it a sense of security? Is it a stable ground for you to build your life? But right now it's not, it's not a statewide problem. It's a global problem that the world is really, we are fluctuating on so many different levels that everyone wants to feel safe. And how can we create that sense of safety so that people can move from, you know, the base of the Maslow's hierarchy of needs and go towards not only, you know, engagement, but also self-actualization? What a sentence to finish on. Oh my God, thank you, you can so tell much. That I'm a political I would question. love a few questions. We don't have a huge amount of time. In the middle, you can yell out your question. I'll repeat it for the recording. Okay, so I actually have two questions. Oh, just pick one, please. Okay. So just for the recording, are there uh, regenerative design projects that address cities and uh, places in the world that are currently an, in a uh, war context, in turmoil, in active uh, warfare? Uh, and a anything that you could share with us. Is that a good representation of the question? I mean, I, I definitely feel out of my depth here, but I will give it a go. Um, so one of the things, talking about language that I find interesting about your question is instead of talking about reconstruction, how do we think of regeneration? Because in a certain sense, it's not about building back exactly what was, but actually how do, since we have a, uh, an opportunity, on, on, I mean, it, with a very double-edged sword, but anyway, like the, a, a possibility of thinking our way forward. I think two things happen in these contexts. First of all, how do we give an, uh, just the same amount of space to the critical as well as to the possible? Because if we get stuck in the critical, of, you know, in this case it's warfare, which is as critical as it gets, I think that we get be can also become entrenched in the reality of the moment, and we need to start thinking forward. Um, I was I had a, a a really lovely, very poignant lunch uh, recently with Olena, who I won't try to pronounce her last name because I will mess it up terribly, but she, she was a Yale World Fellow a few uh, generations after I was. And she used to be, well, she still is the advisor to the Deputy Prime Minister of Ukraine, and she is coming here to the UK precisely to hold this conversation. They're already starting to think of how to rebuild and regenerate their society, and this will have everything to do in terms of cities, which is my agenda, of how do you think about sustainable transportation, of how are we gonna do buildings under more environmental uh, frameworks. So I can't give you the details, but what I was in completely impressed with 
is that this conversation is already happening when they're still in the midst of a very you know, problematic, very painful war. Robin, I feel like you would have possibly a thought here as well. I want to share something with, that is maybe slightly on a tangent, but I, I find it so fascinating, again, on the democracy, um, but as part of the democracy conversation. So I recently came across a foundation, a very low-key foundation, which in very fragile states, um, including post-conflict states, is um, helping be the interlocutor for social media peace accords so that you can run um, elections and reach consensus where both sides agree to stop um, misusing and abusing social media to cloud the narratives. And I just, I think, obviously that's not talking about the project specifically, but I think the, the environment in which you rebuild and the narratives that are shared in that environment are really critical to making the project successful. One last question. You had your hand up earlier. Yeah. on the dot conversation for what I do and what I'm interested in. And uh, it's a conversation, uh, a question for Gabriela that I had, um, which was more about, you know, why was having Laboratorio para la Ciudad directly linked to the mayor of Mexico City? And I think it was a very bold solution or decision that was made at that point, so, which was very controversial for Latin America at the moment, having that direct link and also, you know, some of the experiments that Laboratorio para la Ciudad did were very, you know, first of its kind, especially where we come from. So um, I think I know the answer, but I would like to hear it. <laughs> uh, let me repeat the question quickly. What was the Laboratorio de la Ciudad uh, created and reporting to the mayor's office? Is that the right what, interpretation? Yeah. What was, what was it in the direct link to the mayor's office really key to the why, why was the connection to the mayor's office really key? It's a great question and one that I, I have given quite a bit of thought to post factum, if you will, uh, because it, is, it was both the best thing that happened to the lab as well as its point of fragility in many ways, specifically because, I mean, you won't let me lie when I'm talking about the 14% of mistrust against government. You know what I'm talking about, right? Like, this is, this is a thing. This is huge. This, this was also me before stepping into enemy lines. Um, but so basically what I found incredibly interesting about the lab being right under the mayor was first of all that we as a very tiny outfit we were 20 people and Mexico City bureaucracy is about 350,000 if you include absolutely everybody so you know this is you know half Amsterdam or it's just huge and I'm sure London is is more or less that same size. We were able, I think, if you think of uh, a city as a system of systems and how government actually interacts with that, it was like poising this little apparatus at a strategic place that whatever happened there, it would go into the rest of the bloodstream, if you will, just because of political momentum of the ability to have like all of the ministers on what's up, um, the ability to speak on behalf of the city, to create urban agendas and gather communities around our questions um, and to give it weight, if you will, political weight that then also gave it a sense of possibility. So that was all of the, po the, the incredible uh, things that happened, let's say, in terms of the, the Mexico City Constitution and things that we worked on directly besides crowdsourcing it. One of them that speaks to your thing is we made Mexico City into a sanctuary city. So we worked with several people uh, just like saying, okay, how do we make Mexico City a safe haven for migration that comes through, through the city? So these are controversial issues that I don't think if we had been able to speak as well on behalf of the mayor's office, getting the political clout against, uh, uh, sorry, to push through these things would have been as easy as it was. Then I go to the other side. Um, I sometimes question if a lab space that is supposed to mitigate risk and to be able to bring in new ideas and uh, have government try out other possibilities, is it best placed within government, let alone in the mayor's office? Um, I think it has to have a very close link, but one of the things that I find really interesting about governance 
systems in general is that we still keep on speaking about discrete objects. We speak about government, academia, civil society, citizens, corporations, when really I think we need a much more multifaceted, symbiotic sense of everything that happens in between these spaces. So would there have been a way of creating a lab that when needed to, it could shape shift into becoming more of like government, create policy, work with the mayor's office, maybe the design council does this, I, I don't know. And when needed, because we did so, but not without, you know, with costs as well, become more activist-like, where you can create grassroots movements, where you can, you know, just like have other type of tools to push agendas forward. Um, so the lab doesn't exist, and it doesn't exist because there was a change in, in a party. So belonging to the mayor's office also was our strength while we were in government, and it was our biggest fragility when we left it as well. So you know, there's there's this double thing. Um, but we can have Ms. Gales, and I'll tell you more. <laughs> uh, I know that we've run out of time. I want to thank everyone for coming, for staying, for asking questions. Please connect to our fabulous panelists and uh, join me in thanking them.